So apologies to our virtual audience, but welcome back in person, everybody. <laughs> you were here as well. Um, so I'm very pleased that uh, the first speaker of our reinvigorated uh, Rux Colloquium is Pat Trapto. Um, Pat got his PhD at Northeastern University and then did a postdoc at MIT and Josh Tenenbaum's lab. He then uh, joined the faculty at the University of Louisville uh, before joining uh, oddly enough, the math department uh, at uh, our own uh, Rutgers Newark, where actually uh, sort of a lot of applied work takes place, uh, including the data science program that uh, Pat has been spearheading and leading successfully in his time there. Uh, this year, he's at the Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, he's all had a long history of sort of exciting work at the intersection of machine learning and human learning, understanding the kind of reasoning that it takes to teach and to learn from teaching. And he's uh, taken that uh, in the work that you'll hear about today into open worlds. Pat. Thank you, Matthew, for the generous introduction. And as mentioned, or promised, um, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit today about some of the work that we've been doing recently and more of the directions where we're going uh, regarding learning in open worlds. And so I phrase the, the title in this way to both highlight the amazing advances that have happened in cognitive science and machine learning over the past 10, 20 years, but also to highlight their limitations, which I think are shared. Um, <clears throat> if we think about cognitive models, they've become incredibly powerful. Um, but they're limited in, in fairly particular ways. When we build these models and when we fit these models, they require lots of data in very focused tasks. And what this means is that you know, if we were to really generalize beyond these tasks into adjacent tasks, it's going to require replicating this data collection problem. Um, and so to build sort of large scale models that can deal with the complexities of the real world will require massive amounts of data. Um, this focus on particular tasks also yields brittleness that can be kind of tricky to, to work around. And so for different tasks, different people will come up with different models um, that are in many ways related, but we don't have systematic ways to compare and unify and, and, uh, um, and uh, sort out these uh, detailed differences. Um, and of course, uh, as many have critiqued already, the, many of these models require intensive computation in, in some cases, implausibly, in many cases, implausibly so, even for moderately sized domains. Um, Recording in progress. I would argue that uh, machine learning has the, a similar sort of profile, obviously, in a different scale and in a different way. Um, so machine, modern machine learning models require massive amounts of data. So this is um, uh, exemplified by, for example, ImageNet, which is a training data set used to, uh, for image classification thousands of categories, millions of images, um, just to learn these thousand categories of which you know, humans have countless more. Um, GPT-3 is another example in language that um, has been trained on massive amounts of data to produce what is effectively a reasonable chatbot, but not necessarily um, a reasonable model of language. Um, these models, despite their intensive training, are also quite brittle. If you introduce a new class, they fall apart. Um, <clears throat> In, in the case of ImageNet. Um, and so there's sort of uh, issues of uh, data uh, distribution shift uh, that are fundamental and difficult to overcome. And of course, they require massive amounts of computation, um, in, in some cases, uh, enough power to uh, uh, power a large, a small city, um, and you know, many days or sometimes weeks of computation. Um, <clears throat> and so if we think about Human learning, I think this contrasts um, quite starkly with these, uh, these uh, existing technologies. Um, and the way I'm sort of wrapping this up is to, to think about it as a problem of open world learning, right? Um, as opposed to these closed worlds where you have specific tasks or um, uh, that are well outlined and dense data sampling within them, um, humans face an open world learning problem. 
you and I will never experience all of the languages in the world, we'll never see all of the animals, and so on and so on. There are just so many uh, possibilities and possible configurations of, of the world that in our lifetimes we have no hope of even reasonably densely sampling um, what is uh, the true diversity of, of the world. Um, and so I'm characterizing this as the experience is vastly underspecifying the true state of the world. Um, and, and this is actually quite different from the way we think about modeling, the way we think about statistical guarantees, or the way we think um, about uh, uh, the goals of learning in general. Um, and I'm going to try to highlight that along the way. Three features that I think are, are critical in order to uh, succeed in open lear world learning are the ability to learn from small data. This is a theme that has occurred in, in machine learning as well. Um, but I'll take it on a particular case of it, um, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, the second one is that you need to be adaptable, right? So most of modern machine learning and cognitive science relies on inductive biases that are built in a priori. Um, and there are sort of two, two big problems with that. One being you have to have uh, complexity in your model that covers all of the possible worlds rather than just the worlds that you experience. Um, <clears throat> and that has computational consequences um, uh, that uh, are undesirable. Um, and then the last point is that inference, um, in many cases, has to be effectively simultaneous with experience. Now, this doesn't have to be true in all possible circumstances. We think about things over time, for sure. Um, but if you're faced with a tiger, you'd best be able to figure out it's a tiger pretty quickly, or the game is over. Um, and so we need to think about, I think, inference uh, approaches that don't have dramatic lags between observations and uh, an updating of beliefs in order to characterize um, this kind of open world learning possibility. Um, so as an example, we can take one particular case of learning from small data, um, which is exemplified in this picture here. So one of the ways that humans go beyond their limited data to leverage um, the breadth of possible uh, data that could be out there is we learn from other people. And the idea behind that is that the other people can either highlight or give us knowledge of things that we ourselves never experience. And then we can go forward and leverage their experience, which is only indirectly our own. Um, so in this case, um, the uh, adult is pointing out uh, a cardinal, and the children are learning what a cardinal is. Um, <clears throat> and so if you think about this, and, and the argument is there are specialized adaptations to be able to do this effectively so that we can actually succeed in open world learning. Um, and the idea behind these is that we cooperate. Um, we assume the other person is cooperating, and we cooperate when we choose um, information to pass on. Um, this idea of cooperative information sharing appears across literatures and across tasks. So here are a few uh, models that have been drawn, uh, that have been developed across a host of literatures. So here we have a few that are from cognitive science, uh, here and here and here. Um, we have a few that are from machine learning, um, and we have one from robotics as well. These are all models developed to account for the same basic phenomena, which is passing information between one agent and another in a cooperative fashion. Um, these models are not the same, however. Um, and people argue about, well, which one is the right one? Um, but we have no real effective way to adjudicate, aside from doing detailed experiments each time. And what, I would, what I'm going to argue for is that in order to organize this zoo of models, we would be, uh, be best served to have mathematical ways of formalizing the collection of them and then deriving properties that we can guarantee for the whole class as well as contrasting within the class uh, based on different assumptions. Um, <clears throat> all right, and that's going to lead us to more robust models that will hopefully lead us toward open world learning. So again, the path forward here is, of course, the intersection of behavior and computation that I think is taken for granted these days. Um, but the third axis or, or circle here is mathematics and the ability to formulate models at sufficient generality that we can prove basic properties of them um, that both unify models and differentiate between specific cases. Um, so this is the work that I've been doing for, for a number of years now. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about our, our efforts um, um, and I think the, why, the implications of this are, are potentially widespread. So um, we can imagine, although I don't think it's real yet, that there's the possibility of new foundations for mathematics. Um, 
so just like we think about counting and that led to number theory and we think about geometry and that led to, um, well, we think about spaces and we think that led to geometry and then topology and so on. I think learning agents are ripe for this kind of innovation. It can also lead to improved theories of human learning and machine learning and humans and machines working together. Hopefully that's sort of evident from the communities who have been interested in this kind of cooperative problem. Um, I think the implications are in fact quite a bit broader. Um, in, in, uh, in that there are, I think, contributions to be made to the, the broader world of um, uh, in improving technologies that people have access to. So to exemplify this, I have this little picture, which is the output of a model that we called CrossCat. Some number of years ago, uh, I developed this with colleagues. It became, uh, this was based on sort of into, you know, formalizing models of cognitive science. It became a paradigmatic example um, in Kevin Murphy's machine learning textbook, Machine Learning a Probabilistic Approach. Um, it led to companies that were acquired by Salesforce, by Tableau, and new companies um, that were still growing at the moment, um, that uh, are used across a variety of business situations to make predictions and explain data. Um, and so I think this is an example of the fact that if you think about human learning and optimize your models for human learning, there is a much greater promise for uptake in broader society. Um, and so that's sort of what we're demonstrating. And what I'll try to highlight along the way today too. So again, um, we'll have uh, most of the talk will focus on this learning from small data, thinking about the case of cooperative communication. At the end, I'll revisit as a sort of collection of future directions how we generalize this to uh, beyond social situations to more general cases of learning um, and address these uh, three challenges in that context. Um, and recall that our goal here for the cooperation portion is to pose some mathematical tools that will help us understand this zoo of models. So in order to do so, um, we, sh we can think a little bit about what we're imagining the problem to be. So we have a learner observing the world, right? Um, they observe, they have beliefs, which we represent here as an, a manifold in their head. They're going to observe data, which is going to update their beliefs. And so we might ask, well, what tools would we use to describe this kind of stuff? Um, one obvious choice is if we're talking about beliefs is to use probability theory. And I hope people sort of guess that one. Um, in the world of mathematics, the way of describing movement of distributions, that is changing of beliefs, um, uh, a natural choice is what's called optimal transport. Optimal transport is an old area of math. It goes back to Gaspar Monge, uh, who was working for Napoleon on moving berms for defensive formations for armies. Um, <clears throat> it was updated to its modern form uh, by Leonid Kantorovich, um, who uh, was a Soviet mathematician um, in logistics. So the basic idea here, and we can think about Monge's example, is we think about some distribution, we'll think of it as a histogram, um, can be generalized, we'll call this one A. So this is a probability distribution, right? It's um, uh, familiar to everyone here, I hope. Um, and we'll think of a, a destination distribution, right? Which we'll call B. And you can see that it has a different form than A. Um, and what we want to do is describe, come up with a plan that will move from A to B. And we'll assume that there's some underlying cost function, which specifies uh, for all pairs. So we think about maybe A on the columns and B on the rows. Um, we'll have non-negative numbers that describe the cost of moving from each point on A to each other point on B, uh, moving between those two. Um, <clears throat> and again, we want to come up with a plan we'll call P star which is optimal in some sense. And in the precise sense here that we're aiming for is we want the one that minimizes the, uh, the cost. Um, <clears throat> all right. Um, and so you might ask, well, where do, where do these costs come from? In the example from Monge, uh, you can think about it as distance, right? You pick up a shovel full of dirt, you need to walk over to the other place, and then you can cash that out as movement in terms of distance. And in fact, that has a very nice geometric interpretation that we could talk all day about. Um, 
you can also think about it as a utility. Um, so in the case of utility theoretic calculations, this is sort of one standard way um, of caching this out. And we can also think about it as a probability um, in, in the standard way of taking the negative log of the probability, which makes it, uh, turns it into a cost, uh, a non-negative number that represents um, for probability one, no effort, and for probability zero, infinite effort. Um, so we can uh, build these costs out of a variety of tools, including combinations of these tools, which of course turns out to be important if you want to bridge different areas of uh, machine learning and cognitive science. All right, being a, a touch more formal about it, we want to set up a problem where we look for P star, right, which is going to be um, the argument that minimizes um, the inner product of the cost and the plan. So this is the Frobenius inner product, which is quite simply um, your element-wise product between our uh, cost matrix and our plan matrix, which is, uh, describes which ones are going to get moved to where and what proportions. Um, and we want to minimize this total. Um, there are constraints, however, um, right? which is, I think, sensible. If we want to move from one distribution to another, then whatever our plan is, if we marginalize it this way, it should be that marginal cost. And if we marginalize it the other way, it should be the other marginal cost. So this set of possible plans that satisfy these marginal costs A and B that I gave you um, is represented as U, um, UAB. Um, and we're going to look at all the P's. We want out of all the P's in that set, P star, the one that minimizes the cost. So this is a formulation of optimal transport. Um, <clears throat> and as I said, it's a venerable and old area. Uh, it's also been subject to many modern advances, including two fields medals in the past couple decades. Um, so, uh, and it's become a, a central tool in machine learning for reasons that I'll tell you about now. Um, <clears throat> Optimal transport has become uh, a, a central tool in machine learning due to uh, a rather simple but important advance, um, which, is a general, which generalizes optimal transport to what's called entropy regularized optimal transport. Now, the H of P term here is just your standard Shannon entropy. So we think about it as summing over um, our plan matrix, Pij, log Pij. Um, <coughs> So this is standard information theoretic entropy. We can see this epsilon term as it goes to zero, we recover standard optimal transport. Um, but when uh, the epsilon term is non-zero, we have a contribution of entropy. That is, we want to make it our plans more stochastic. Now, why would we want to do this? There are at least two reasons, uh, three reasons, I guess. Um, one is that. Um, it will make our, uh, our algorithms computationally efficient. Um, two is that entropy is a convex function, and so it makes the solution unique, um, and so it's well-behaved in a machine learning sense. And three is that um, as we take this epsilon to other values, say, for example, one, we'll find out that we're um, essentially building in a probabilistic model. So you're basically implementing plans that probability match to the proportions of costs subject to the constraints. Um, and so this will give us a nice way to hook up with probabilistic models of cognition and machine learning. Um, <clears throat> and this, uh, this formulation and, and the ideas are sort of most recently reintroduced uh, by uh, Marco Cutori in 2013. But these ideas of optimal transport and entropy regularized optimal transport have appeared in a variety of contexts, including physics and operations research and statistics and other fields. Um, over the past 50 to 100 years. <clears throat> All right. So now I'd like to talk about sorting out that zoo of models that we had at the beginning in order to explain how we're learning from small data and what the trade-offs are among these various models that people have been developing. Can we understand them? Um, so in this context, we're thinking of a slightly different scenario, right? We're thinking of our learner is observing a person who's you know, giving them some data. So they had some belief, they're going to observe that data and move on the manifold. Um, or equivalently, you can think about them as stretching the axes. <clears throat> but the basic idea here being, now we have a social reasoning process where we think about why the person chose what they chose. 
And I want to put a little bit of teeth on that. Um, some, many of you might be familiar with these examples, so I'll give, um, uh, but I'll give them anyway because I think they're important uh, intuition pumps. Um, and the idea here is to demonstrate that cooperation can really support this fast, robust learning from small data. Um, and so I'll use an example known as hat and glasses from linguistics pragmatics literature. And the idea is you've got two people, both wearing hats, one wearing glasses. Um, <clears throat> and suppose I come up to you and say, look at the guy with the glasses. Or sorry, look at the guy with the hat, sorry. <laughs> Um, the question is, well, who should I be re referring to? Look at the guy with the hat is ambiguous, right? Because both of them have hats. Um, but you can reason about it from my perspective and say, well, you know, if he wanted to talk about this person, then he would have said the guy with the glasses because he did not. It must be the guy with the hat. Right? And so in this ambiguous context, you can resolve that ambiguity by reasoning about the other person and their cooperative actions. Um, a second example is what I'll call the rectangle game. So in the rectangle game, there's a board. We're going to play, uh, I'll be a teacher, you'll be the learner. I'm going to think of a rectangle somewhere on the board. So it might be something like this, or like this, or like this. And I'm going to indicate where that rectangle is using green dots to represent the uh, points inside the circle, and red X's to represent points outside the circle. All right. All right, so now I'm thinking of a rectangle somewhere on the board, and I'm going to pick the best examples I can come up with, best two examples I can come up with in order to teach you where it is. So this point and this point are inside the rectangle. Question for you is, is it a big rectangle like this, or is it a little rectangle? like this. We're not fully into uh, audience participation yet, I think. Some people are in the uh, <laughs> online, so I'll just give you the answer, but I can assure you I've been giving this example for many years, and the consensus is that people agree that it must be the small rectangle. And the logic works sort of similarly. If I meant to teach the larger rectangle, I should have picked a point way out here. I did not. And so even though these two green points down in the bottom are consistent with the larger rectangle, we should infer that it's the smaller rectangle because I had a choice to choose something that was better and I didn't do it. Um, <clears throat> um, and this really highlights, I think, the power of uh, cooperation for learning from small data. The basic idea behind it being you need two examples. If you're waiting for those by random sampling, it's going to take forever. Even logically, you need four more examples, one on each side, in order to pin down the rectangle. Right? So this is even better than what you would logically expect. Um, and in fact, this two-example uh, two scheme works in, across uh, any dimensionality. Right? You just pick points in the opposite corners. Um, and so this is uh, a, well, uh, a reasonably well-known fact um, uh, for the class of concepts known as monomials, um, which simple rectangles and hyper rectangles uh, live. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip past this nodes and edges example, but it comes from uh, a lovely book by Peter Sarnak on uh, elementary uh, number theory, group theory, and Ramajan graphs. Um, but it's just to demonstrate that, in fact, we use the same basic principles across a host of contexts. So I said this was linguistic um, pragmatics. This example was uh, developed in cognitive science, but is reminiscent of what you might find in robotics if, for example, you're trying to point um, and your system is using bounding boxes to identify uh, candidate destinations of that point in, in, the, uh, um, in the world, and of course, uh, pure math and applied math in giving people the feeling of what theorems might uh, support. All right, so. I, think, I hope the point is made that cooperation enables much more powerful learning in certain cases than, um, than otherwise. And so if we agree on that, then the task is to build upon it um, and formalize it. And so many have seen this before. I'm sorry this is a little bit small um, on the screen. But we're going to formulate 
a problem using a learner on the left here and a teacher on the right. So the learner we're going to think about as a Bayesian learner. Um, and so they're going to update hypotheses given data. That's going to be related to the likelihood of the data given the hypothesis and the prior probability of the hypothesis. And there's a normalizing constant to make sure it all adds up to one. Now this is almost exactly Bayesian inference with this interesting notational shift here where we say that the points are not sampled by a random process like a Gaussian distribution, but instead chosen by an agent who is described on the right hand side. So we want to describe a teacher selecting data given a hypothesis. That's going to be related to the probability that the learner infers the right hypothesis after seeing the data. The prior probability of the data, for example, favoring smaller amounts um, or easier to get data. And of course, normalized um, to uh, ensure it all sums to one. So we can cash this out for the hat and glasses example if we would like. So we can think um, we're going to need some pieces here, right? We're going to need to specify a prior. Um, we're going to need to specify on the hypotheses and on data. Um, <clears throat> it's going to have to be shared across the two agents, which is an assumption I'll come back to. For the sake of this example, we'll uh, think of these as constants um, because it will simplify matters. Then if we have some initial uh, way of setting the likelihood matrix, for example, uh, the logical consistency of the statements, hat and glasses, with the examples, right? Our person with the hat and our person with the glasses. And we can see that they both have hats. This person does not have glasses. This person does. Now, if we want to start this recursion and thinking about it as a fixed point iteration, we need to come up with a likelihood in order to do this. So we uh, want the probability of the data given the hypothesis. So we normalize down the column here. Um, and we'll normalize to one because that'll make life easy. So here we go. Right? And so that's the initial step of what you might expect if we weren't cooperating. But then we can go and ask, well, how is the learner going to update their beliefs? Right? And what that entails is normalizing row-wise now. And so we can think about this. Sorry, two-thirds, one-third, zero, one. And so all we did was make it all add up to one row-wise. And that gives us that learner's update, which we can plug in on the other side and do the same thing again. But now right here, we can update to what the teacher should do in response. And so we can go to one, zero, and one quarter, three quarters. Um, and we can keep going on this until it arrives at a fixed point and what you should C by this point is that this point, this dot right here, is going to zero consistent with our intuitions, which is that we should, for this person, say the word hat, and for this person, whoops, say the word glasses. Um, zero, there we go. Um, and so this is a probabilistic model that we proposed some time ago, um, thinking of, of this recursive cooperative reasoning. So the new work here that um, I'll tell you about is providing a mathematical foundation for this model. And I'll show that, in fact, provides a mathematical foundation for the whole zoo of models um, that I showed you before. So we'll do this in two steps, because there are two points of connection. Um, now, you can think of this as a recursive, cooperative, uh, probabilistic cooperative reasoning, like theory of mind in, in the sort of cognitive science sense. It turns out that this was anticipated in an extremely different context. Um, by a man named Richard Sinkhorn. Um, and Sinkhorn was interested, so this is 64 and again in 67 with um, uh, in Sinkhorn not. Um, so he proposed this uh, algorithm for taking a matrix of non-negative values and making them normalized to particular given marginal constraints. Now <clears throat> He proved a variety of things about this, including that it converges. Um, he proved that it's a continuous function from a mathematical perspective. Later on, um, Til uh, uh, Tiverman proved that it was a homeomorphism if there's full support. So there's a whole sort of mathematical texture that underlies this. This was, in fact, a mathematical proposal. But the key idea that he, he had is that 
what you do with this matrix that you get at the beginning is you project it onto one of your marginal constraints, and then you project it onto the other, and you project it, and project it, and project it, and project it until it stops changing. And so what he proposed is exactly the same uh, as this model um, for the case of epsilon equals one. And in fact, it's straightforward to generalize. It just incurs some notational um, overhead that I'd rather not deal with at the moment. Um, so this probabilistic cooperative reasoning is exactly synchron scaling. Now, what we've since learned, um, and this is more recent, uh, is that synchron scaling is an algorithm for solving entropy regularized optimal transport. Um, and the basic idea here, uh, which I won't go into, oops, um, is that we have the primal problem, which, specify, which is specified here. Um, and synchron scaling is the Lagrangian dual of that. And the basic idea is that you take these constraints, these marginal constraints, lift them up into the problem. Um, because entropy is a convex function, you can look at the dual and get the same answer, get the correct answer. And so we flip to the dual, set it equal to zero, do some algebra. And what we can see is instead of picking out the optimal plan, we're picking out the optimal rescaling of the marginals, the dual formulation of the problem. Um, <clears throat> and so, these are three equivalent um, mathematical statements, right? The solution to this is the solution to this, which is the solution to that as well. Um, and so now we've gone through synchron scaling to connect to optimal transport, which has hundreds of years of mathematical work and deep connections to geometry and beyond. Um, and so we're going to just scratch the surface today in describing how we can use some of these ma this mathematical knowledge to make statements about these models that we've been thinking about. So here's the full list of models that we started with at the beginning. Recall that there are some from cognitive science, there were some from machine learning, and one from robotics. And they all were different. Um, and they were claimed to be good models for their particular context. But the tasks differed, all kinds of things differed. And so what I argued is what we want to be able to do if we're going to understand open world learning is we have to be able to systematize models, unify them, and then understand from a mathematical perspective what really are the material differences between them. And so in this case, we can formulate that along two dimensions. One is the depth of the synchron scaling. So this should be epsilon. Um, <clears throat> so models differ. Some of them iterate till convergence, right? As, as I described to you. Some of them take only one or two steps. So we might ask, how should we think about those differences? And the answer is, well, Syncorn is uh, monotonically converges. So one or two steps is effectively an approximation of the complete solution. Um, and so we can think about all of these as approximations of entropy regularized optimal transport plans. On the other side, we might ask, well, this epsilon, right, which we saw as a parameter that controls the entropy which is essentially, as epsilon goes to zero, a greediness parameter. Um, and so you can see that we can formulate greediness, we can formulate uh, probability matching, and we can ask, well, what happens when you pick other values typically in between those two? Although there's interesting machine learning for the case where epsilon goes up also. Um, <clears throat> and across all of these cases, what you get is that um, the epsilon value of one has some unique and sort of nice properties that I'll uh, specify in just a second. So we can think about, but you can think about all of these as approximations of various kinds. So this is just a greedy approximation, whereas this is probability matching um, uh, to the entropy, uh, epsilon one entropy regularized optimal transport. And so you might ask, well, what can we say about these? Um, collection of models. Well, here's a, a proposition um, from our recent paper in NeurIPS uh, where we say, say for any non-negative shared matrix, so this is the likelihood that we started out with, that consistency matrix, right, so we'll think about it as that. Marginals, this was P of D, and this was P of H. This here is synchron scaling. So we're thinking about, let's get a, add a perturbation. Right? So we're going to add an epsilon. 
sorry, the notation class here, but the basic idea is we tweak them a little bit so that the teacher and learner don't align anymore. So we violate common ground. Um, and so we're going to ask what happens when you do that. Does it break entirely? Now we should be super sad if that's true, right? Because that means that these models probably are totally irrelevant, practically speaking, because you and I don't know each other's beliefs. So um, assuming these two um, limits exist, then what we can say is that this perturbed limit goes to the uh, unperturbed limit as the perturbations go to zero. Another way to, uh, to talk about this is to say, for bounded perturbations at the beginning, you get bounded perturbations at the end. And so from a mathematical perspective, this um, is a robust process that will uh, be less, uh, not tragically sensitive to uh, perturbations. Okay, so we can prove that these are robust to common ground, which was an assumption that all models built in and never analyzed. Um, <clears throat> We can actually go further, right? We can ask, um, what about those differences that we were talking about, the number of recursive steps and the parameter values? Can we understand those also? And I won't go into the details uh, uh, deeply here, but we can actually analyze those differences as well. Um, and we can do it through uh, an invariant property um, of this uh, optimization procedure known as the cross ratio. The cross ratio characterizes is a property of the uh, initial matrix that's preserved to the final matrix. And so, um, and we can predict certain aspects of the final solution based on that cross ratio. And one of the things that you can say is, well, the fewer steps you recurse, the less robust you are to perturbations. The more greedy you are, the less robust you are to perturbations. And we can validate this, I won't go into the details, but with a, a collection of uh, simulation experiments that show that in fact this is true across sizes of matrices, randomly sampled, um, different uh, marginal uh, values, and so on. Um, and so people can draw me back if you want to talk through the data, but um, these are provable properties that are confirmable by simulation as well. Now you might also ask, well, Robustness would be a property that we'd hope humans would possess as well. So let's take a look at human data. So we'll just look at one example. Um, this is a result from the data here are taken from uh, Noah Goodman and Andreas Stolmeyer. Um, and it's on the sum all implicature, which the details of which will allied for the moment. But the orange bars here represent human probabilities of choosing um, guesses about how many apples there are in a scene. Um, the blue is their model, Rational Speech Act model, which is a one-step model. And you can see it has a reasonable approximation of the data. Um, in the green, um, it has a single parameter, that greeniness parameter that's fitted. Um, and we used their parameter to do so. Um, <clears throat> here is the uh, result for the full recursion with um, epsilon of one, so a probability matching model. We didn't s uh, set that. And what you can see is that the robust version of the model actually characterizes the data better. So this is just one example. Of course, there are many more studies um, that we could go into. Um, but the basic point here is that robustness in the model uh, yields a better fit to human data as well. And, and hopefully that's uh, an intuitive consequence because you know, we can't possibly know each other's beliefs perfectly. Um, <clears throat> all right. So. We've already talked a little bit about potential mathematical implications. You can kind of, I think, see where I'm going, where we can actually translate these models that we think about in, in probabilistic machine learning and, I, and also neural networks, although I won't talk about that today, in these more rigorous mathematical formulations. It's clear that we have something to say about theories of human learning and machine learning and how they might work together. On the social front, we can also cash out these theoretical ideas for practical problems. So one such problem is explainable AI. It's the problem of extracting um, explanations from, for example, deep learning models, which have high predictive accuracy, but are also opaque. And as a consequence, cannot be used in, uh, currently in situations where there are high stakes, such as medicine or the military or intelligence or other places where legal consequences follow. Um, and so what we've been doing as part of the DARPA XAI program is developing explainable AI technologies that we've since validated with radiologists in, di um, in understanding AI predictions about pneumothorax. Um, so that's one example. We've also been developing AI assistance for human teams that reason about people cooperating together and asking, are they doing well? 
Um, and so this is part of the DARPA ASSIST program, um, which is again another effort to sort of improve human understanding of AI and improve our ability to work together. And of course, we have gratuitous numbers of papers. These are all explainable AI papers. Um, and then uh, this one in the middle is a nice reinforcement learning, um, teaching reinforcement learning with natural language paper. Um, so what I hope you get out of this so far is that you know, there are these big problems of open world learning where we want our models um, to uh, function in the world without having to be densely trained on each specific circumstance. Um, and we have certain capabilities that humans have for, uh, for doing so one of which being learning from small data. And so uh, what we did was we systematized existing models using mathematical tools, proved various properties about them, used those to derive consequences that were yet unknown in the literature. Um, what I'd like to turn our attention to now is going beyond this, right? Which is that learning from small data is not just an imperative from learning from other people, but also being able to learn yourself from interactions directly with the environment. So it's not strictly a social problem. If your experience is gonna vastly underestimate the truth, you need to be able to draw sensible conclusions from limited data um, on your own. And so that, I'll give a, a nod to that. Um, I'll also talk a little bit about how we might think about adaptable uh, machine learning tools that go beyond their inductive biases to adapt to what they experience. Um, so machines can be misspecified at the beginning, but nevertheless arrive at sensible conclusions at the end. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, I'll vaguely wave my hands at how we might get to simultaneous inference or something close to it, um, hopefully. Um, and hopefully it's not a surprise that, you know, what I'm going to use to build this bridge are the mathematical tools that I already set up. Okay? Um, and we're going to think about a generalization of these mathematical tools. Um, so recall that our problem here is we're observing the world. Sorry, we'll use white. So we're observing the world. We've got um, experience, our beliefs beforehand, and our experiences drive us um, across this manifold to some new point. Um, and so again, you know, tools of optimal transport should be useful. The question is how to formulate it. Um, and what I'm going to argue is that what we should do is come up with ways of unifying both social reasoning and non-social reasoning. Um, and if we think about that pedagogical problem, it has sort of an interesting feel to it, which is that you think about a person who has a, a hypothesis, they're going to generate data with the hopes that you should be able to figure out which of the possible hypotheses were uh, the one that they were trying to teach you. So in some sense, there's a more general casting of it as a recognition kind of problem. You want to recognize hypotheses from the data that the person selects. And in fact, you can give this sort of an information theoretic treatment as well. Um, <clears throat> and so, using that more general way of thinking about it, we can think about this entropy regularized optimal transport problem and uh, impose a relaxation on it, right? Because we may not know the marginal constraints on the data, for example. Um, in fact, in Bayesian inference, you don't typically have that constraint. So here, recall that A was our P of H. Um, we're going to make this, if we think of epsilon going to infinity here, and this one was P of D, um, and we think about this one um, going to zero, that will drop this piece out. And up to proportionality, you get something that's equivalent to Bayesian inference. And so you have this nice generalization that if we allow both of them to go to infinity, we recover the original entropy regularized optimal transport. Um, but now we have a way of thinking about in between points as well. Um, and this is known as unbalanced optimal transport. Um, and it's a straightforward generalization of entropy regularized optimal transport. Um, and in fact, there, you can go quite a bit farther. Um, and the idea here is that it allows you to sort of titrate the fact that, you know, Bayesian inference is probably very good if you allow for lots and lots of data. But if you have to make a decision now, you need a policy that aligns particular data to particular hypotheses. So you can make that decision sharply. Um, and that was the original um, sort of entropy regularized optimal transport formulation. And so we might think about agents' horizons for decision making as being between that sort of very long term and that very short term. Um, and that might even be problem specific. 
Um, and so by unifying these two, we can then think about short horizon decision problems and ro more robust learning from small data when the costs are high, for example. The second case that I think is interesting here is um, adaptability. So the current state of the art in cognitive science and machine learning suffers from what, a, what I'll call the paradox of induction. Um, this is not Hume's problem of induction, this is the paradox of induction, which is that um, because our hypotheses are built in a priori, we have to build in expressive enough hypotheses to deal with any possible data. Otherwise, our machine learning or human learning would fail. Right? Um, <clears throat> and so this is sort of the, the end game for much of the machine learning world. So in probabilistic machine learning, people do claim to anyway do inference over all computable programs and you know neural networks it's approximating a broad class of functions and this is sort of the the current state of the art but what we want is some way of saying well you know we've got some way of mapping between observable possible data set possible ob observed data sets and possible hypotheses but as the possibilities go up the number of hypotheses go up and if we're being sort of proper about this and thinking about discrete things this is actually an exponential growth problem. It's not just a single one, um, but in fact, if we think about combinations of these data sets, then we get an exponential growth problem. Um, and this leads to bad consequences. First of all, you have to be able to guess uh, the, the true state of the world or possible states of the world um, accurately a priori, which is, of course, hard. Um, and second, even if you do, your computational problems are big. Right, because this space is growing exponentially in the possible experiences. And so it would be desirable to have more compact or adaptable ways to specify reduced in, uh, hypothesis spaces that are then mapped onto not potential data sets, but actually observed data sets. Um, <clears throat> and so we can think about this as a coupling problem. Um, I haven't used that word yet, but you can think about the problem of optimal transport as a problem of coupling two probability distributions. So if we think about coin tosses, we might think um, here are the possibilities maybe, 3 out of 10, 5 out of 10, 7 out of 10. We might think about different coin weights. These would be the built-in hypotheses, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.7. Um, and it's no surprise to anyone that, of course, you built it in, and so you have a good explanation for all the data sets. Hooray. But what happens if there's a misspecification? The actual experiences that you wind up with are 5 out of 10, 7 out of 10, and 9 out of 10, but you still have these hypotheses, right? And what you see is that those main diagonal can't characterize your experience well anymore. Um, however, if we think about a uniform prior and a uniform marginal on data, what we can see is that if you couple these two using entropy regularized optimal transport, you get back that adaptability. Um, you can fit to the experiences that you have um, without having a priori specified everything correctly. Um, so you can think about this as a generalization of the classic purse problem of an abduction, right? where we're changing our inductively specified hypotheses to ma better match or explain the observed data. Um, so this is a toy example um, of a much broader possible set of phenomena. The last case I'll say just a little bit about is the possibility of advancing toward more simultaneous inference. Now this is obviously a huge stretch at this point. Um, so you should take this all with a little bit of a grain of salt. Um, one of the things that we've been thinking about is sequential optimal transport. And we've been proving a variety of properties about it. For example, that it converges, it's consistent in the same ways that Bayesian inference is. Um, but if you look at it, it has a key problem that is a problem in Bayesian inference and uh, neural networks as well, which is that you observe data, you then have to update your hypotheses, observe data, update hypotheses. And usually this step right here is computationally hard. Right? So if you observe data, updating your hypotheses is computationally difficult for Bayesian inference because you have a normalizing constant in neural networks just because you have to do um, uh, gradient descent or perhaps even start over depending on how your model is set up. Um, <clears throat> but what we should, I think, take heart in is that I've been drawing this picture from you. And this picture is, you know, somewhat schematic, but it actually is um, correct in, in a very precise sense, which is that um, <clears throat> the underlying problem of doing this estimation is movement on a manifold in a, a well-defined space. And so this 
convergence is actually a convergence where our point is going to one set of uh, uh, corners of this um, uh, simplex um, and following this manifold. And so the idea here is that perhaps, just perhaps, we can take um, this sequential operation and turn it into an infinitesimal one and think about geometric flows on this manifold. Um, and that's work that we're doing right now. Um, <clears throat> and the key idea here being that you observe, there's no clear distinction anymore between observation and computation. It should sort of flow together um, or be driven by the input. So to summarize, um, what I've argued is that both cognitive science and machine learning has, there have been amazing, fantastic advances and they're not to be underestimated. But there are still quite significant limitations. Each of them requires a fair amount of data um, uh, for, for various reasons, mostly because they're very task specific and they need dense sampling in order to estimate the models. Um, because they're task specific, they wind up being quite brittle. They're not designed for open world problems. Um, and they require typically intensive computation. So there have been detailed critiques of cognitive models by Iris Van Rouge and others. Um, in machine learning, the same profile exists, right? Which is that they require massive data. Obviously the tasks are different and the scale is different, but um, they still require tons and tons of images to learn what a dog is. Um, they're brittle. If you add a category, it doesn't, uh, typical models don't perform well. The computation is um, unrealistic for inside of a human head, of course. Um, uh, they have to live in you know, server farms with cooling and so on. Um, and so we're missing something, I think, about the efficiency with which humans tackle learning. And I think it corresponds to this idea of open world learning, which is that um, if we're going to encounter learning problems where our experience is going to vastly underspecify the truth, we might approach learning somewhat differently. Right? And, uh, and we would do so in a way that allows us to learn more robustly from small amounts of data, to be adaptable to what we see more than what is you know, the total possibilities a priori, um, and to do so quickly and energy efficiently. So um, at this point, I should thank the generous funders, including NIH, various NSF directories, Department of Defense, um, intelligence community and a variety of DARPA programs who have supported this and other research in our lab. Um, the wonderful, wonderful researchers who work on these projects, including I'll highlight Pei and Jesse, who are two of the authors on the, uh, on the uh, work that was featured today, but, but all of them uh, are wonderful and fantastic people. And of course, thank you for coming and listening. Jacob, you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Can you hear me? Just barely, yeah. Yeah, hi. Yeah, great talk. I mean, great to over such a huge uh, array of the field. Um, I just had a question about one connection that I, I wasn't sure if you had made. Um, there's this whole literature in statistics on what are called you know, M open problems, uh, M closed problems. Very closely related to what you were talking about, in the sense, you know, it's model open or mm -hmm. model closed problems. The, the idea of being that most of statistics historically is done in an closed mm -hmm. context where you assume that the truth is somewhere in the model space. Yep. But um, in the last 10 years, there's a lot of things to have open inputs where you can't assume that. It's more, more or less part of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so I know the basic results in, in that so world. Can you repeat the question? Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> ah, so, so Jacob's question is that in statistics, there's a distinction between M open uh, problems and M closed. Um, in M closed problems, you assume that the, uh, one of your hypotheses is the right one essentially, or the truth is in your hypothesis space, and M open being that it's not. Um, and he was asking um, if there are connections and, and was I sort of aware. And so the, 
you know, I, I'm familiar with the basic results. Um, for example, that Bayesian inference will converge to the closest point in KL divergence to, um, uh, to a hypothesis that's not in the space. Um, but um, it's an interesting point, and I don't know the literature that well, um, but I would love to talk more about it. I was wondering if you could uh, maybe elaborate a little bit more on I think the observable AI approaches. The sort of the, essentially, what's the sort of uh, you could talk about the practical utility uh, for users, you know, DARPA funding work, for instance, uh, of being able to sort of articulate these measures like the legal the legal issues around it. Um, but in practice, does it lead to better solutions than non-observable AI? So John's question was about um, explainable AI, and um, uh, I talked a little bit about the, the legal and, and, uh, and ethical reasons for it, but his question was about whether it uh, gives rise to better solutions. And I think this is a great question. Um, it's a current direction um, that we're working in. So sort of we thought of, you know, in the, in the program, thought of the problem as, you know, train a deep neural network and then find some way to extract information from it in a way that's sort of vertical in the sense that the person can, you can show that the person generalizes in, uh, is able to predict the AI's behavior, right? Um, <clears throat> but of course, the, the obvious next step is to say, well, you know, if the AI's predicted behavior is bad, what do you do, right? Um, and the answer is, well, you should be able to interact with it somehow. Um, and, and that's a little bit tricky uh, with the current sort of setup, right? the state of the art at least you know, a couple years ago. Um, there's, there's movement in this direction now. But the basic idea is like, can you extract a data point that's wrong and retrain it easily? You, know, you can always you know, cache the whole thing out and then start over again, which is obviously undesirable. Um, but to be able to do it point by point is gonna require a little bit of uh, architectural care, right? The, the learning models have to be sort of uh, specified in a way that you can extract that information, which is not generally true of neural networks. Um, <clears throat> so this is, um, I think, a really interesting and fruitful direction that we've worked a little bit on, but we are nowhere near like a really comprehensive or interesting solution, I think, at this point, um, because it does wrap up sort of the, the challenge that, you know, existing the really high performant existing models have architectural considerations that just don't suit that that well. Um, so it requires a sort of rethinking of more than just, you know, how do you put it back in, but how do you build the model in the first place? And I think it's a great question. So for, for the folks, I don't know if people heard, 
Uh, but Matthew's question is uh, is about the uh, the pragmatics um, model and the interpretation associated with it, and in particular. Um, to what degree we should think about it as a social, a model of social reasoning after sort of the first go, right? Which is, is that a reasonable characterization? Like, so say we come to this conclusion, then, you know, how does that change the underlying beliefs and things? Well, or, right. because, because, because Don Sperber would look at your point and say, look, I was right, Grace was wrong. The meaning of some is underspecified, and it gets a specific meaning in context by cognitive principles. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think as, as suggested by my sort of later um, pivot, I, I, I wonder how much of that kind of recursive reasoning is specific at all to theory of mind. In particular, like that's the way we think about that recursive reasoning. But for example, synchron scaling admits many other ways of solving for that fixed point. Um, for example, gradient descent. Um, and in fact, the sort of best algorithms are second order gradient methods um, for, for making that solution. So you know, there's a question of like, to what extent we think of that as sort of uh, integral to the sort of reasoning process. Now, I think the other half of it that I sort of heard is like, you know, is this really to what extent is there sort of a division between the social and the non-social? Um, and you know, what happens once we sort of agree? And there are many stories that one could tell. You could think of it as like a reinforcement learning style story where like if we agree on this small applicature once, then we add one tick in the winning box and you know, keep going, right? And that's sort of one story you might tell. Another story you might tell is that Success at this kind of language problem fundamentally changes our, our beliefs in an interesting way. And this is more consistent with, I think, the story that you were telling, which is that you know, that might sort of live on, and we might never recompute that sort of sum all implicature again. Right? You might just sort of have it around as that's the meaning of sum, is that you, know, you have some number of things, and it's not all, and it's not um, none. Um, and it winds up being cashed out essentially as a cognitive principle after the first attempt. Um, and I think. You know, the, that I think has, uh, I think that's a very attractive story for a variety of reasons. One of which being like, when we agree as language speakers on a, a convention, you don't just probabilistically continue sampling. That's bad, right? <laughs> um, we just keep it if we can remember it, of course. Um, and uh, the reason why is because there are many solutions to these kinds of conventional kinds of things. And so you want to sort of pin it down as quickly as possible so that we can just agree and move on. Um, another is the computational story is like, if we want to really get to sort of fluent language or, or reasoning, then we should probably not go back to that initial matrix every time, but then keep around our solutions and use those as the seeds for the next computation. Um, and that, of course, makes a lot of sense also because it's also just a point on that manifold, right? And so you can sort of keep moving that uh, around um, and passing that information. And so, um, <clears throat> so you know, I, I'm very sympathetic to your point. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I'm not sure I would go to the mat on one side or the other. But to say, you know, I think the story should be driven probably by efficiency, explanation of the data, um, and ultimately effectiveness and sort of, um, uh, you know, scaling up to interesting problems. So uh, for some time now, rationalists have been pointing out for associationists that experience underdetermines the knowledge animals achieve. And often in that tradition, the mood is to say, yeah, you get these very specific problems, and you do very specific computations to get them solved. And so we shouldn't expect um, generalization across the model, right? If someone were to say, I find a model of uh, insect navigation over here, and a model of how human kids deal with the English auxiliary system over here, I'm not going to make a lot of progress by insisting um, are there really both generalizations from experience if I just throw enough computational power and uh, uh, math and technology as a problem, I'll see the unit. So I, I, I take it within the cognitive science that that message has sort of at least gotten through in pockets. And so, so I'm, what I'm just wondering is if you've got some 
some just general advice, God knows not, not definition, general advice about where it's appropriate to look at, say, the six models you looked at and say, yeah, those were good bets that, that, that the animal really was in some sense learning from experience in a generalizable way, as opposed to cases where, look, it's just uh, very different tasks uh, and we shouldn't expect to see generalizations uh, because it's just fundamentally different kinds of uh, computation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is a great question, so let me try to recapitulate at least a portion of it, which is that, you know, there's sort of an age-old debate that, or argument that, like, experience underspecifies the truth, and so um, I sort of use this uh, as sort of a fodder for thinking about the various models and saying, well, we should sort of mash them up and understand them better, and, and then um, that'll help us sort of understand generalization um, to the degree that we can. Um, and the, the question was, like, how do we know when, when we can do that and when we can't? Um, <clears throat> um, and uh, I think ultimately that's a hard problem, of course. Um, and the reason why it's hard, I think, is, is actually really interesting, right? Because, like, you know, most of the things that you were mentioning have some form of learning. We, I think we would all agree, right? So you think of ants, you can think of, you know, wildebeest, you can think of people. They all learn at some, in some way. Um, uh, but even on similar problems, do they learn in the same way? Um, and I think that is a really hard and tricky problem um, uh, that has to do with par partly with the conceptual resources um, that they have available to them. Uh, and that includes, for example, social learning, you know, the mechanisms of social learning, but also the constraints that the environment imposes on them. Um, and so uh, I think that you know, can be incorporated in some of these models potentially, um, but those external constraints are really important, right? So if, if an animal has to, you know, basically stand up and walk within an hour of being born, then, you know, I think it's a good bet that their learning mechanisms for learning walking are somewhat different than ours, right? It's not just they start sort of further along, but there might even be like fundamental differences. And so I think those external constraints probably play a key role also. But I mean, I don't have a real satisfying answer to this general problem, um, uh, although it's interesting. Uh, could, for generalization, could you give a poorly specified follow-up? Um, so I'm going to try to think about, following up on the last two questions, about the learning and production of sequences, uh, and whether there's something in your approach about the Persian or and other pieces of this that might have some particular applicability to sequence, uh, to sequence learning. I was just curious if you have an immediate reaction to that. Yeah, so the question is, like, is there anything in this framework that um, could be applied to sequence learning? I think the sort of vanilla thing that one would do, because we have the connection to Bayesian models, is say, well, let's learn a hidden Markov model or something like this, right? Like, and you can do that, right? I, all of the models that I talked about we're specified in fully general form, right? It's just probability distributions, and that could mean anything you want. Um, and so that would be one route to go. Um, <clears throat> I haven't sort of hit this hard, but I'm a little bit sort of skeptical of the sort of standard approaches. Um, this comes back to the question of like, how many different mechanisms do you need and so on. Um, one of the things that falls out of this kind of approach is that, um, is that invariant uh, idea. That is, there's an invariant in the cost matrix that is preserved through to the plan. And what that means is that there are a whole, it's actually compressing like a bunch of cost matrices down onto one particular plan. So various possible probabilistic models get collapsed. So many of the distinctions get pushed down. And so I think this introduces an abstraction barrier um, that might be particularly useful or explaining hard problems. And one of the hardest problems that I see is, of course, these kinds of sequential problems where there's combinatorial explosions involved. Um, and so I don't find the hidden Markov model story that compelling because that's a very hard problem once you think of it in that way. I don't necessarily have a great alternative yet, but um, I agree it's sort of one of the most important questions. I was wondering if there's anything that can be said when, when you talked about you know, models that use much smaller data sets, is there anything substantial that can be said about how small is small? 
And for background, what I'm thinking about, some of us who think about some tasks in language acquisition take seriously things like maybe one trial learning. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if we're talking about smaller and smaller, is there any sense in which we're heading towards those super small, even in the limit of one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, the story about the sum all implicature, you know, you, there's a learning story that has to go on in the background, but that was a one, one shot type of task, right, that we did um, in, in the room. And of course, you have tons of background knowledge that helps that, yeah, which is always the case. The worry there is that, that that one might be a one shot, but only in, because you yep. got a lot of background. Your priors are set a certain way. Yeah, well, I mean, this is always the story, I think. The model or have to be just right. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Like all of the one shot and you know few shot learning kinds of scenarios, zero shot. There are a million of them these days. Um, they all hinge on having either built in a solution to the problem yeah. at the beginning, or just tons of relevant experience. Um, and I think, I think it's an interesting question to what degree there is sort of few shot learning that goes beyond those two cases. Um, and you know, I, I think. At least to me, I don't know that there's a really compelling case that these things are really real, that we can learn that for some domain somewhere, we can learn in you know, one shot um, uh, for, for reasons that are separate from those two candidates. Um. So just, just to follow up with that, right, uh, uh, like, can you just give me a feel for how you want to like describe, let's just say, right, the, the, the famous Dyer and Dickinson uh, experiments where you've got the bees uh, and uh, you only let them forage on cloudy days uh, in the afternoon. Uh, and then the next morning they go out and do the right, uh, uh, do the right thing uh, in response to the dance uh, mm -hmm. and coming back. So look, I suppose you challenge the, the finding, but assuming, assuming that finding is basically correct, that's getting close to uh, uh, one shot, two shot uh, learning. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think in those cases, the, you know, the explanation that I'm aware of, and I, if there are others, feel free to you know, jump in, is that somewhere, somehow, the bees have that built in, the meaning of that dance. Um, and so it's built in a priori. And so this is the sort of two cases that I think you know, are really hard. Like, to what degree does real learning from really small data exist? Well, outside of the cases where it's either built in or you have a ton of experience, there aren't a lot of candidates, um, as far as I know. Cooperation being a case where you can sort of leverage a different kind of knowledge. But, and so it's, it's about the way people act rather than you know, about the direct domain. But it's still a kind of knowledge. Um, so we can debate whether that's you know, a satisfying resolution or not. <laughs>